Hey everyone, welcome to church. So glad to have you join us both here in North Van and Squamish. Wherever you are, I invite you to stand to your feet. We love to worship our God together. We love to praise him for who he is and what he's done. together in spirit and in truth. God, you're so good. We just lift up the name of Jesus. There is no other name. We sing together. Yeah. 
God, we declare that you are holy, that you are good. There's no one like you, God. You are our shield, you are our hope, you are our refuge. In you, we put our trust. In Jesus, we can surrender our lives to you. We trust you because you are a good God. Jesus, I surrender all to Him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Father in heaven, we are today in such awe of your goodness. We put our trust in you, and therefore we can surrender all, because you're always faithful and trustworthy. Spirit of the living God, come and fill us so that we may overflow with the goodness and the love of God 
We thank you for being present with us, that you promised that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you would give us your peace. And so, Lord, today we pray for your shalom, for your peace to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, as we bring things that weigh on us, worries, troubles, fears, God, we surrender them all to you. And we say, have your way in us. Help us to be faithful witnesses of your goodness, of your redemption, of your faithfulness to the world around us. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. Welcome to church. So good to see you here. Uh, I think we're going to dismiss our youth. <laughs> youth, we love you. <laughs> They're going to go across the street over 1166 Alberni Street. Have fun. And as they go, we're going to have some others that are going to fill up their space. My name is Fari. And I'm Allie. And another warm welcome to everybody joining us at church today, to our campuses. Hi, North Van. Hi, Squamish. Hello, everyone joining us online. We see you. And we're so glad to be at church with you today. That's right. Well, today, Pastor Cheryl was over at Yale Town. Pastor Dave will bring us the message. We're excited for it. We're in Book of Acts, chapter 6 and 7. But before we get into that, we'd love to bring to your attention a few announcements. And as we do that, please scan the QR code. You can follow the announcements there. And all the links that you need are there as well. Please use this Staying Connected card as well if you're here in person. This is a great way for you to let us know if you have any prayer needs. On the back side, you can write that down. Please don't do life alone. You're stressed. You're burnt out. You don't know where to go. We want to walk with you. We want to pray with you. We have a God who cares. Amen. And so mm -hmm. write that down. We pick these up every week and we pray for them. Also Saturday mornings we have prayer here as well. So if you want to join us, please do so. Ali, we have some cool things coming up. We Alpha do. is one. Alpha is one of them, and that's one thing you can use the Staying Connected card for. Uh -huh. If you need more information, we'd love to send it to you. But Alpha, it starts this week. Yeah. We're so excited. We love the Alpha course here at Coastal Church. And if you're asking, hey, what's Alpha? Well, you should come and check it out. Mm -hmm. Starting this week, it's a 12-week course, and it's we have it starting downtown Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Um, if you've ever had questions about your faith, if you ever had questions about Christianity, who is Jesus? Why did he die? Alpha is for you, or maybe you have friends who might be asking those questions. They're like, why do you do this whole church thing? Well, Alpha is a great place to invite them to. You get to share a meal together. Uh, you'll get to meet some new people. There'll be some worship. There's going to be a video on the theme of the night as well. Then you get to dialogue with other people with similar right. questions. So Alpha is amazing. Um, we do have a few locations running. We have online That's as right. well as North Van. I believe you're doing one on Wednesdays. Um, but again, you can check the QR code. It will take you to all of the resources as you need or our app as well um, that you can find all right. the information on alpha but be there it's amazing we love alpha we love alpha join us for that also coming up if you have not yet been water baptized hello what are you waiting for people if you've given your life to jesus christ the next step is to go public Come on. as we know we said we are not ashamed of the gospel of the lord jesus christ so what he's done for you through his Amen. death burial and resurrection and that again baptism is that picture of you going stepping into your watery grave and as your lord immersed into the water that's what baptism means immersion you're immersed and you're saying to the world that i my old life has died with christ buried and as you come out of the water again it's a picture of the resurrected life that you have in christ as a new creation so let us know you can fill out the registration form online it's really easy you can scan the qr code and then we will get back to you, let you know of all the different details of what you need to bring, where it's going to be, as we have a class on the same Saturday at 3.30. So let us know. We'll love to take, help you take this next very important step in your Christian life. Amen. We also have... Um, are, are we doing that? Let's do it. Young married. Yes, we are. Because it's this Friday. Come on. April 12th. Young married couples. Young married couples. If that's you, Young. you're in your 20s, you've Can't. been married five no. years or less. Five years or less. So that's less. it. Five years or less and you're less and you're in your 20s. There's a young married couples this 
event this Friday here at the church. Uh, you can register online. Again, that QR code, it's good for everything. Uh, register <laughs> online, but um, I hear that Pastor Dave and Cheryl are going to be there just yeah. giving some wisdom. So if you need wisdom for your marriage, plus years wisdom come on. Being married. This is a deep well. You want to come and draw it out. Yes. Um, if you have questions, if you have, need just some wisdom, or if you need to meet some other married couples who are in a similar season as you, this is the perfect place to do it. So if you have current plans this Friday, you should cancel them and you should come to this um, and enjoy some food, enjoy some activities together, but also just getting some good wisdom and connection. That's it. So Coastal Church, you're amazing. We love walking with you as your pastors, uh, as you grow in your Christ-likeness and in the Word of God and in, in your most holy faith. You're growing in that and we see it to your generosity. Thank you for being a generous church. Again, we have a recap video of our Easter. We had such an amazing time. How many of you had fun? Come on. Yeah, you enjoyed it? You, wasn't it a blast? Celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a recap for you. Thank you for being generous. Again, you make that possible that we can do things like Eden Ministries, that we can do alphas and life groups and other means that we reach our city. So you can do that through an envelope that is right here in front of you in the pews or online coastal app or e-transfer. Please let's be generous and do it cheerfully as we are doing it as an act of worship and saying, God, everything that I am, I surrender all. Amen. That means your wallet. <laughs> that mm -hmm. means your finances. That means your time, treasure, talents. Yes. And that's what well, I always mean. We surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he takes what we give him and then he multiplies it into changed lives, transformation taking place. So thank you for doing that. And then right after this Easter recap, Pastor Dave will come up with the message. Sunday. Welcome to the Orpheum We're with Coastal. We're at the Orpheum with Coastal. Come with us to talk to some of our Coastal Church family to see what their favorite parts of Easter is. Let's go. On a scale of one to 10, how stoked are you guys that the stone rolled away? Oh, 12, 11, 12. A <laughs> hundred on a scale of one to 10. <laughs> I think anything less than 10 is the wrong answer. <laughs> like all the numbers. <laughs> 12 out of 10. 13. <laughs> Seven? <laughs> well, without it, we'd be stuck at Good Friday. So I'm grateful, grateful for Resurrection Sunday. What's your guys' favorite Easter memory? Oh, favorite Easter? Actually, every year we spend Easter at Coastal Church since you were born and dressing up for church, celebrating with church family. Favorite Easter memory? Um probably like 10 minutes ago in the car, just like listening to Man of Sorrows and crying. <laughs> One of the best thing is that I've started serving and that's just like a uh, feeling that I belong and then it's more meaningful for me now. What does Jesus' resurrection mean to you guys? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> big question, Danny, big question. Um, it's it's everything, right? Like if it, I think Paul says, if it didn't happen, then then our faith is in vain. By his stripes we're healed in Jesus' name. And so this is a day to remember that. This is a day to celebrate what he has done. So that's why we dress up. Come on, it's the most important uh, day of the year. We don't have to worry about anything because we know that he resurrected. For me, I can be really hard on myself and try to be so perfect in everything. And what his resurrection means is I don't have to be that. He can rise from the dead. He can do anything. There's nothing on this earth that's more powerful than the God we, we serve. Listen, my sins are forgiven. It is done. There is an overarching story of what God is doing in this world. The resurrection gives us purpose because in that we realize, God, you wrote me into your story. I have a part to play. There's nothing more fulfilling than knowing I'm doing what Jesus asked me to do. I know that Jesus like, you know, was killed because of us to be forgiven. So I think it just reminds me of that peace. Jesus' resurrection to me means that um, someone can love us so much more than I can even understand, and that's pretty out of this world. In a faith journey that just is unpredictable, Jesus is predictable. Jesus is my hope. Happy Easter! Happy Easter! <laughs>
guys. Thank you so much. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Good luck on the Easter egg hunt. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna be great. <laughs> Maybe we're better with strangers, honestly. Strangers are nice. I like them. <laughs> oh, what a great time we had. Both on Good Friday and on Resurrection Sunday, thank you for all of you who came out, supported, served, gave into it. It was great to be able to do that. You may be wondering, when do we get to do that again? Stay tuned, August 31st, September 1, that's Saturday and Sunday. We're going to be not at the Queen Elizabeth, not at the Orpheum. We're going to be at the Vancouver Convention Center to celebrate 30 years. So mark the day. Cancel your trip to Hawaii and make sure you're there for that. You cancel your, your, your hiking trip and anything you got planned that weekend, take it off. We're going to be gathering together, celebrating the goodness of God. Big shout out to those that are watching online and tell us, those online, whether you're there also in North Van with Pastor Chris at Squamish. Glad you guys are joining us today. Would you look over your neighbor and just say, I'm glad to see you in church this morning. Come on, give them some love and give them a big smile. We're glad to see you watching online today as well. Lots to celebrate. We are in a series under the theme for the year, which is Go. And today we're in the book of Acts, picking it back up in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7. Would you say with me this morning, thank you, Lord. For the book of Acts. This week in our life group, we will be reviewing that, going through the text, Acts 6, mostly Acts chapter 7. If you're not in a life group, Pastor Fari will give you some instructions later on in overtime how you can be part of a life group here today. Well, this is an amazing message, uh, not because of the speaker, but because of the text there in Acts chapter 6 and 7. Luke is the author, Dr. Luke. He wrote the book of Luke, and then he also wrote the book of Acts. Luke is a lot about what Jesus did. Acts is a lot what he does through believers. And so we're going to be looking today primarily at a guy by the name of Stephen. You may have heard of him. He's the first martyr in the Bible, so we'll get to that. We'll talk a little bit about his life first of all. The setting is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem right now is still the focus of where the church is at. After Acts chapter 7, there's going to be a shift. We're going to see people scattered because of persecution, and then it's going to go into Judea, Samaria, and to the rest of the world, which is what Jesus said would happen. He said, you shall receive power, and you'll be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So the shift will happen after Acts chapter 7. Today, it's still having a spotlight on Jerusalem. Now, there's some tension in Jerusalem, and the reason there's tension is because the church is growing super fast. They're now up to at least 10,000, maybe 20,000 people in the church, and the population of Jerusalem is only about 40,000 people. So you can tell that this church is really uh, influencing the entire city. Not everybody likes it. Some of the people there are a little bit upset because they have spent a lot of money, a lot of energy to make Jerusalem what it is. For some of the Jews, they had gone and they'd been dispersed in other parts of the world. And then when they retire, they move back to Jerusalem. Think of a place like Palm Springs, Miami Beach, or Arizona, where people say, I want to move there and retire there. I want a nice stable place. I want a place where I can come and have all these amenities and so forth. And, and I, I want it to be a certain way. Well, the church growing, it, there was a major social disruption. And so not everybody liked it especially the people that were of these Hellenistic Jews, Jews that were from other places and had come back. It was disturbing them. And one of the people that was upsetting them was a man by the name of Stephen. The apostles, of course, they had been preaching and, and sharing, and now others were rising up. And these were people that weren't apostles. They were deacons or other leaders, people in the church. And God was working mightily through them. If it was just a few, it wouldn't have caused a disruption. But now, this thing has been contagious, and everybody's catching it. And they're sharing the life and the love of Jesus. Lives are being changed, and their town is being changed. And so they're upset about it. And Stephen enters into the picture. 
We know from a couple weeks ago that Stephen was chosen as one of the people to serve in the church. In his, his, his life is known for being a man of character. We, we've said in the past, uh, a good way to choose somebody to work for your company or for leadership is they have to have character, they have to have competence, and they have to have chemistry. Well, Stephen had all three of those. He had good character, he's a very competent, educated, well articulate, well-spoken person, and he also had the chemistry. He knew the DNA of the people, the church, and so forth, and so he was chosen. But Stephen, I'd like to say, he was also a man of unwavering faith, and the most precious thing you have is your faith. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. 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 That's what the enemy would be after. That's what pleases God is your faith, and Stephen was a man of faith. So we're going to look today at his faith life and how it can affect us. What can we learn from a man of unwavering faith. So the first thing I want to say is that his faith inspired him to serve. In Acts chapter 6, verse 2, verse 5, reviewing this, we read, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. We need to be praying. We need to be studying the Word of God in order to feed people. We have to be doing that. We're getting so busy doing all the other work, we can't do that work. So what did they do? And see, the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He, he's a man of faith. And so they choose him full of the Holy Spirit. When you are a follower of Jesus, you will naturally want to serve. It's not something like you have to do. It's more something I get to do that. You don't, you don't have to give. You don't have to serve. It's just like I get to do that. That was the attitude of Stephen. He was excited to do that. And his role was to be serving the tables. They had people that they were feeding, particularly widows that they would feed. And his role was to go and to, and to serve the tables. I don't know if that was his first passion, and I don't know if he was the world's best at serving tables, but there was a need, and he was going to meet it, and that's important. He could have said, I have other gifts, and I think my gifts should be used elsewhere. Let somebody else serve the tables. No, when they asked him to do that, he's I'll gladly do that. I think he was following the example of Jesus. The Last Supper, Jesus, we know, washed the disciples' feet. And it wasn't because Jesus had this unique ability to wash people's feet. It was just that nobody had done that. He saw the need, and he stepped up and did it. But then he said to us, I'm giving this to you as an example. I want you to put a towel over your hand, and I want you to serve other people the way I'm showing you. And so Stephen is a good example for us of how we should be also serving other people. When we lived in Tennessee for not quite a year, Cheryl and I had gone to Bible school there. And during that time, we wanted to go to the Happening Church. There was a church in town, all the buzz really happening, and all our friends were going there. But the Lord spoke to our heart and said, I want you to go to this little Pentecostal church. And so we went there, and we really felt impressed to go there, and we wondered, what are we supposed to do here? But we ended up serving with the pastor. His name was Brother Littlefield. I, to this day, you guys, I still think about the lessons from Brother Littlefield. He had a way of stretching us. He had a way of making us feel uncomfortable where we served. And, and he had put us in these different locations. He said, I just need somebody to serve here. And I thought, you know what? I, I think I could be doing something else a little bit better. And then he'd give us this lesson over and over again. He'd say, children, he called us children. He's children, here's the deal. If you want to be used by God, Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. And then you go to say, if there's a need, find a need and meet it. That's the key. Just find a need and meet it, and you'll find plenty to do for Jesus. Folks, that still works today. Find a need and meet it. Can I say this as well? If you see a need, that's probably uh, your cue to do something about it. Somebody once said to me, boy, we could sure use some ushers over there. I said, well, <laughs> that's probably because... The Lord's tapping on your shoulder to go over there and help us. You're over there. Somebody said, boy, we could sure use some more prayer in the church. Guess what? Who's being called to prayer? You're being called to prayer. Usually the area that we see the need is the area that the God's directing us to. So there's all kinds of different needs, different ways to serve. And you could serve on a Sunday morning 
doing ushering, or you could serve on a Saturday coming to prayer, or you could serve on a special event setting up, or you could serve in the community helping Eden, or you could serve in so many different ways. But I think if we're a follower of Jesus, we'll want to serve. Amen? And sometimes it's not things that's our first gifting necessarily. It's just that there's a need and we need to do it. One day when we came, we'd work with Brother Littlefield in the afternoon, school in the morning, and, and one day he said to me, he says, I, I need somebody to drive my, my bus to pick up people. We went into the hills of Tennessee and brought people to church, and he said, I need a bus driver. He says, can you drive a bus? I said, I've never driven a bus. It was this big, long yellow school bus, an old yellow school bus. And it, it should have been retired, but it was still running, so he drove it, and he said, well, I need you to drive the school bus. I said, but Brother Littlefield, I've never driven the school bus. He said, you grew up on a farm, didn't you? I go, yes. He said, well, can you drive a grain truck? I said, of course. He said, well, then you can drive a school bus. <laughs> so <laughs> there I was. And he said, now, find a need and meet it. This is a need. Get into that school bus. It'll be good for you. Well, I got into the school bus, and I went up into these hills. And you guys, the hills there in Tennessee, the roads are really narrow, and I would remember going around corners, I'd see the back tire hanging over. Oh, I got to make it around this. I was so nervous driving this school bus. I think, God, what am I doing? There's probably somebody better who could be driving the school bus. We picked up a lot of people that were, uh, had some intellectual disabilities. They were challenged. And I wasn't used to working with people like that. I was so out of my comfort zone. One fellow got on and he got onto the bus and he looked at me. He says, how you doing? All right. Before I could say anything, he says, all right, and he smiled, and he went and sat down the bus. I said, okay, I'm just going to drive the school bus, and, and then the next day I picked him up, or the next Sunday, he said the same thing. He got on, how you doing? All right, all right. He says, what's your name? I said, my name's Dave. So then I went to pick people up to drive them back, and he saw me across the parking lot. He says, hey, Dave, how you doing? All right, all right. <laughs> you know what? I grew to love those people. I love people that were out of my comfort zone. And Brother Littlefield, he knew that the whole time. He put me there for a reason. He was trying to teach me something. So sometimes when we serve, we're finding ourselves out of our comfort zone, but it helps us to grow spiritually. And it may just be preparing you for something greater God has for you. So this man, Stephen, he was a man of faith. And faith inspires us to serve. We want to serve. We're not compelled to. It's not we have to. It's like, I get to do this. I get to do it for Jesus. He says, if you've done it for the least of these, my brethren, you've done it for me. When we look at the man, Stephen, we also see a man that had miracles following his life. Acts 6, 8 says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. You know, in Matthew, Jesus says, these signs shall follow them that believe. He doesn't say, these signs will follow the evangelist or the special preacher that shows up in town. No, it says, Find, follow those who believe. We have a lot of miracles that take place in our life groups. A lot of miracles that take place in Alpha. We have an Alpha night where we just talk about healing. Now, we could make a whole big deal about it, but I just think it's normal that when you pray, miracles happen. That's a normal life of a believer. And so it wasn't just for a few, for Peter and for John. It was for all believers. Stephen's a believer, so miracles are following him. That's a, a person of faith. We just believe that as we pray, God's going to do the rest. My job is to pray. Let God do the rest. And Stephen was a man of miracles. He was also a man who had courageous faith. In Acts chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, actually 9 to 12, if you're following along in your Bibles, it says, but one day some men from the synagogue of the freed slaves. So they had a special synagogue. They had temples, and then they had, they had the, the temple, and then the synagogues. The temple was a place where the priests were. Synagogues were outposts, if you like, that reflected what happened in the temple, where they'd read the law, talk about it. And different groups would build their own synagogues. This was for those who had once been slaves, but had bought their Roman freedom. About 100 years before this, Pompey had come in. He had captured a lot of Jews, taken them away. Some bought their freedom. Now they've come back to Jerusalem, and they had their own synagogue. It's this group that's agitated with Stephen 
Saul, later called Paul, was a part of this group. And so they're agitated with Stephen. And uh, it says here that they could not stand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses, even God. They roused the people, elders, teachers, the religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. So what was upsetting them was we first had Peter and John and these other disciples. Now this thing's contagious and people like Stephen are doing it. He's educated. He's one of us. And he's now gone to be part of this Christian movement. Some of our priests have gone to be part of this movement. Our town's being turned upside down. And so we are upset about this. He courageously stands up against them. This is the Sanhedrin. This is a Supreme Court. And I have to admire Stephen for standing up and boldly sharing his faith. We might wonder, well, what would happen to me in that situation? Could I do it? Probably not. I don't think Stephen could either, except by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's remember that verse. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus said, in that hour, there's going to be times in your life where your faith is tested. People are going to call you out. People are going to say things about your Jesus, disdain your faith, even question why you go to church or why would you want to go to Alpha or why this or why that. You have to know in that moment, you're going to receive power. That power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you'll feel that working for you, giving the words and the courage to stand. Stephen's courage was rooted in his unwavering faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's where our faith needs to register as well. In a way, it was Calvary all over again. The same way they had accused Jesus and got a mob up against him, they're doing the same thing against Stephen. Got some liars lying against him, and so he's tried. They ended up killing him. They didn't go to the Romans like they should have. It's really a lynch mobbing that they do against Stephen. But he loses his life even though he stood up, and they could not... Uh, counter what he had to say. As a matter of fact, it says they plugged their ears and just yelled at him. And sometimes today, when you try to articulate our faith, you can have a mob mentality where people just get upset and just run at people and try to cancel them. This is early version of cancel culture. <laughs> they're, they're trying to cancel Stephen. But here's the thing. When, when somebody dies for their faith, you would think it would go quiet. But the blood of the martyrs only causes the Christian faith to increase, not decrease. His faith was based on the Word of God. This week in our life groups, we'll go through his message, Acts chapter 7. It's the longest sermon in the book of Acts. And you'll find something. He knew the Bible. He quotes different passages. God brings back to remembrance what he studied. That's a good cue for us. You know, God can only bring back to your remembrance what you've studied. The Bible says, hide his word in your heart. In overtime, uh, Anthony and Farah talk a bit about how do we hide God's word in our heart? What, what can we do to make that happen? Memorize his word, learn his word. In that moment, it comes back to him and he, he points out to them in his wonderful message that God will move and wants to move in the nation, in every nation, every people group of the world. He, the Jewish people at the time there, and he, he, he does this an amazing job of, of showing them, that yes, the law was needed, but we couldn't keep the law. And God didn't just come to the people that were worshiping the temple. God was moving outside the temple long before the temple was built. And he's trying to build a case here that this God that you worship is for everybody, not just for the Jewish people. They, would, they thought, you no, know, it had to be through the temple, through the priests. And so he says, well, look at Abraham. God spoke to Abraham in Mesopotamia, and he wasn't in the temple. God spoke to Joseph in Egypt, and God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. God is moving. There's this progression. The law was needed. Yes, the Jewish people are chosen. Through them would come the Savior. But this was for everybody. Aren't you glad it's for everybody? 
And so something's about to happen. He's showing them in his sermon that this is for everybody, for all nations. So it's based on the Word of God, his wonderful message. And he gives a message that really stirs them up. And his response to them is one with grace and truth. I want to encourage us today that as we live out our Christian life, we need to live a Christian life that reflects Jesus. Amen? What does Jesus have? Grace and truth. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. What comes first, grace or truth? Grace. What attracts us to Jesus? Grace. Later on, John says here, grace upon grace. He doesn't say truth upon truth. After this and the rest of John, we'll have many mentions of truth, but first is the mention of grace. What draws you and I to Jesus? It's his unlimited grace. Amen? You know, it doesn't matter what you did, how horrendous it was, how many times you did it, God's grace is still there for you. It's literally unlimited grace. And we live in a world that we like a God of unlimited grace. But we're not so sure a God of absolute truth. We want a God of relative truth and unlimited grace. <laughs> no, no, no. It's absolute truth and unlimited grace. We need both of them. They, they complement one another. And we see this in the life of Stephen, that he demonstrates this. Truth becomes hard if it's not softened by grace. Grace becomes soft if it's not strengthened by truth. Truth without grace condemns the sinner, and grace without truth condones the sin. So how did Stephen demonstrate this? Acts chapter 7, verse 50, we read, here's what he says to them. You stubborn people, exclamation mark. <laughs> this is the end of his sermon. <laughs> you stubborn people. Another translation says, you stiff-necked people. You are hardened at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. What's that? That's truth. But does he give grace? Absolutely. What does he say to the same people when they're stoning him? As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge him with this sin. And with that, he died. What was it in what he said that would attract Saul, who was persecuting him? I think it was this latter statement. Grace. Grace would draw in Saul. Grace draws you in. Grace draws me in. But it's the truth that sets us free. Amen? So we need both. We need grace and truth, and our lives should be reflective of that. Well, lastly, in his faith, we can talk about he had a faith worth dying for. Revelations 12, 11, I'll put up on the screen. This is a verse that we often quote. I find it interesting that we usually quote the first two pieces, but we don't quote the third piece. So it says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testimony. And often that's where Christians will stop quoting it. But there's more to the verse. And they did not love their lives to the death. This is Stephen. He overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. What happened on the cross? That's where his victory is. It's in the cross. And then also, he has a testimony. How do we overcome? By the word of our testimony. Here's what Jesus did for me. He set me free. He forgave my sins. I'm a new person in Christ. This is how we overcome. But also, we overcome when we surrender all. There's a reason why Pastor Brad chose that song for today. I surrender all. I surrender my life. When I sing, I surrender all, I'm surrendering my life, it means, God, I'm no longer the captain of my life. I'm no longer the Lord of my life. As a Christian, when I say Jesus is my Lord, that means I'm not Lord, amen? Yeah. That means Jesus is Lord. And so when we sing, I surrender all, we're saying, I surrender my life to you. And if it should be that I would have to lay down my life for you, then I will lay down my life for you. I surrender all. This is Stephen. He surrenders all. Rembrandt, the famous painter, in 1625, at the age of 19, he paints the stoning 
of Stephen. It's his first painting. People are intrigued as to why this would be his first painting. I don't know the reason. Maybe somebody does, but they're intrigued by it. Of course, Rembrandt, brilliant painter. There's a lot of art in this picture. There's a lot of unique things that he's doing. One, as you can see, the left-hand side is dark and the right-hand side is light. And it, it represents a shaft of light coming from heaven, the glory of God that's upon Stephen. Stephen is looking up, his hands raised, because he's seeing something that nobody else is seeing. He's seeing Jesus. He's seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus had said to Pilate, I will be sitting at the right hand of God. The text says he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I don't know what caused Jesus to stand up, but I just think that he stood up to give him a cheering. <laughs> you know, if you're watching something, you'll get off your feet and you'll give a standing ovation and you'll cheer them. I think, I think Jesus is cheering Stephen on. And he commits his life into Jesus. And, and that's really what's ticking these people off is the fact that he would equate Jesus with God, that Jesus would be there at the right hand of the Father. So he looks up and he sees him there, and he's committing his spirit. He's forgiving those that are, that are killing him. He's not weeping. He's not cursing. He's ready to meet his Lord the first martyr in the Christian church. Rembrandt always painted himself in. He's back here. You can see him peeking between there. He, he would always try to identify with the crowd. He's not stoning him, but I think he's intrigued. I think he's looking. I think he might be even saying, you know, I, I too have been slow to forgive, or I... I, I can relate to what's going on here. You can see him processing what's happening in the back. It's worth noting that Rembrandt paints in Saul. This is Saul sitting over here. Saul, would, the scriptures tell us, he watched the stoning of Stephen, encouraged the stoning of Stephen, and he held the coats of those who were throwing the rocks. And so he's over there. When he forgives the people that are stoning him, when Stephen does that, a seed is planted in this man's heart, a hardened heart. But you know when a seed gets into the right soil, it can produce a hundredfold. And sometimes we think those that are maybe upset with us following Christ, maybe it's a relative, somebody here this morning, you have a relative, a friend, or maybe a brother or sister that's upset that you're going to church, you're thinking, oh, they're not, they'll never get it. When you walk in love, and you keep your eyes on Jesus, you never can tell what that seed's going to do. And that seed landed in Saul's heart, and later on he became Paul. We'll get into it in Acts chapter 9, but he becomes probably the greatest voice of Christianity was sitting there encouraging people to kill him. So never doubt what God can do through your love and through your testimony. And his life is forever changed. So Stephen becomes our first martyr. In 1563, John Fox wrote Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's an account of martyrdom up to that point. And there was a time in your home you had Fox's Book of Martyrs and the Bible and, and maybe Pilgrim's Progress. And so if you want to, you can pick up Fox's Book of Martyrs. I just encourage you, don't read it at night. It's not bedtime reading. It's, it's kind of gruesome the way so many people died for their faith. But it's filled with testimonies and miracles of how people were just excited to go home and to be with Jesus, faithful to the end. So, well, Pastor, what does this have to do with us in Canada in 2024? Good question. That was another time and another era. But I think we have to be alert. I think we're living in end times. The spirit of Antichrist has been loosed. And more than ever before, there is an active disdain for Jesus and for the church. Let me ask you this. When was the last time in a movie or television or media somewhere where the church or Jesus was represented in a positive light, other than a Christian production? Normally, it's undermined. Jesus' name is undermined. 
even in our own country. Since 2021, there's been close to 100 churches that have been burnt. Very little said about it. The silence is deafening. Even in our own church on commercial, somebody tried to light it on fire. We caught it in time, put the fire out, repair the damage. But very little said about it. And I could go through a list of things where we see the seeds of persecution already at work in our nation. And so I think Canada is not the same country that it was 100 years ago or whatever it was. One time was a Christian nation, today it's a secular nation. And today we have to prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts, prepare our children. Be, and how, we say, well, how do I prepare myself? The number one way to prepare yourself is be a person of faith. Faith carried Stephen. Faith carried all the saints throughout the ages. It's faith that carried them. The number one thing you can do is be a person, be a man, or be a woman of faith. Faith will carry you. We have many around the world today that are being persecuted. They tell us that on average, 13 people a day are martyred for their faith in the world. Rarely makes the news. Recently, there was a number of your brothers and sisters in Nigeria that were martyred for their faith. Over 14,000 churches were destroyed last year alone because of a hatred against Christianity. And there's about 300 million people, 300 million Christians in the world today that live under threat of persecution. So we'd be naive to think, well, they'll never come to Canada. I think we have to be alert, be sober, and pray into it. Pray that it doesn't come. Yes, but let's be alert. Amen? Let, let's not be naive. Let's not have our heads in the sand. Let's, let's be alert. And prepare our hearts, prepare our soul, prepare our faith, prepare our children, prepare our teens. Uh, I've been asked a number of times uh, recently, how do I prepare my children for the Canada of the future? Because they, they're, they're getting a different Canada than what you grew up, Pastor Dave. How do I prepare my children? And, and I'm thinking about even making a message just on that. But the first thing to do is teach your children to be close to Jesus. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into the burning, fiery furnace. They came out without smelling like smoke. Remember the Pastor Simon's sermon on that? They didn't even smell. They weren't bitter. They weren't hateful. They went on to have great careers. That, that's because there was a mom and a dad who, who taught them faith. Your faith will carry you. Stephen's faith carried him. Your faith will carry you. Faith is the greatest force on this planet. And if we have faith in God's word, faith in the name of Jesus Christ, it's the same name, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we put our faith in Jesus, it'll carry us through all the storms of life, even to the point of death if need be. Likely that's not going to happen to us in Canada, but we may have other stones thrown. It may be canceled, it may be a sustain. There may be people who, who say, I no longer want to be your friend. You're not invited because of it. So we might have some minor stuff. But at the end of the day, it's very important that we stay fully committed, fully surrendered to Jesus. You may be watching this today at one of our campuses. Maybe you're watching online or even on TELUS here this morning, and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Let this be the day that you do that. Jesus totally surrendered his life for you, totally laid down his life for you. And he says, if you will lose your life for my sake, you're going to find life. He said, what would, what would it gain a person if they gained the whole world? They gained everything. You know, uh, Elon Musk has so much money. Bill Gates has so much of the world. What if you gained the whole world, but you lost your soul? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you surrendered to him? I want to lead you in a simple prayer to surrender your life to him. It's, it's a big decision. I understand that. Many of you gave your life to Jesus at the Easter service. I don't know how many hands went up, but they, it was a lot. Maybe this Sunday is the day where you said, I've never fully surrendered. I'm still on the throne of my life. And today, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Would you pray with me today? Let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I surrender my life to you. I call you Lord of my life. For I believe that Jesus died and rose again that I could have life. I want that life. And I accept you today, Jesus. Amen. 
If you prayed that prayer for the first time, maybe you're watching online, you can let us know. We'd love to pray with you there. If you're here this morning, you prayed that, you can scan the QR code, fill out the Connect card, talk to us after the service, come to Alpha, but keep journeying in your faith. That's important. We're going to be singing that song, uh, I Surrender, and Pastor Brad and the team will lead us in that. Uh, let's make that our prayer this morning, okay? Let's, let's not just sing a song. It's not just something that's filler in between this and as we talk about over time. Uh, this is really meant to be a prayer. Lord, I surrender all. It's not a one-time prayer. We do it again and again. And as, as they lead us, you know, um, when, when they lead us in worship, it's not just leading us in the singing. I, I like to follow Brad when he leads. Others, in, if they're raising their hands, then I raise my hands. They're, he, it's, it's not by, they're not just doing it, you know, for kind of a kind of show. It's like they're, they're trying to help us, lead us into worship. And, and raising holy hands, it's not a new thing. That's the ancient form of worship. Paul said, raise up holy hands. It's a sign of surrender. Somebody puts a gun in my back and they surrender, I automatically put my hands up. I surrender. <laughs> okay, you got me. <laughs> and so when I, when I raise my hands, I'm like, Lord, you have me. <laughs> I surrender. But also, raised hands, a child raises his hands to his daddy. He said, Daddy, lift me up. Often I'm raising my hands, I say, Father, lift me up. I need your hug. I need your love today. So we're going to sing, I surrender all. Pastor Fari is going to lead us in prayer for the persecuted church. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll take some time just to talk about how do we apply the message today. So please, Pastor Brad and team, let's uh, sing that song, I Surrender All. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Let's stand, sing together. Let's lift our hands. All to Jesus I surrender. Dad, we 
have the ability, because of what Christ has done for us, to surrender. Going from a place where, like Saul, with a heart of stone, where God comes in and he replaces it with a heart of flesh. Today we want to, as Pastor Dave said, pray for the persecuted church. We want to pray for us that we will be steadfast and enduring until the end. We are running a race that is set before us and we're running for gold. We want to finish that race. And so let's pray for, for us and for the Capital C Church. God, we thank you for the local church here at Coastal where we get to do life together. Lord, I pray that we would be steadfast and strong, courageous, faithful witnesses, regardless of the pushback and the opposition and even the ridicule that we might receive. Jesus, you said that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You promised that you would never leave your children. You would never leave your church nor forsake us. And so, Lord, we pray your blessing, strength, and comfort for all of our brothers and sisters around the world, whether it be in Nigeria or in Afghanistan or in Iran or North Korea, other places where it is dangerous and even deadly to be a follower of Christ and to be open about it. Lord, we pray that they would have the strength that you alone can provide, the comfort and the peace, the shalom that protects hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, Lord. For those who are in prison right now, awaiting their trial, or they're, they're even on waiting for their execution. God, I pray that their eyes will be fixed on Jesus, even until the end. That God, the grace and the beauty of Christ that is displayed through them will draw their persecutors to Christ and that we will continue to see the church flourish because you are the one who gives us strength. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated as we go into a time of overtime and I'll let the campus pastors as well take it from there. Anthony, you're part of School of Missions. Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. He's one of the students at our School of Missions. If you haven't met him yet, say hello to him after the service. Um, School of Missions starts up again in September. So if you're interested and you feel called into missions, into taking about a, a year, eight months or so out of your time to study from, from uh, Tuesday to Saturday, yes. 8 to 12, Yep. Um, it's been a good experience for you? It's been an amazing experience. <laughs> so good. And um, so today, we, the message was so good. Pastor Dave, thank you. We see Stephen, who is a man of faith. The, the Holy Spirit gives him such wisdom that the people can't even resist that wisdom. They can't. There's no way for them to oppose it. Um, it's too much so that they turn to covering their ears and they employ violence in order to shut him up. And... Um, and that's something that Pastor Dave said that we might even experience uh, to an extent here in Canada where people, instead of uh, coming up with an intelligent debate of, for instance, why God doesn't exist or Christ is not the way, yeah. they would rather just lie, twist your words, and even yell, scream, bark, or, uh, or uh, employ to violence and uh, physical altercation. And that's something we have to, I do believe we have to be ready for and respond with, gra respond with grace. Yeah. You never see the Christians, the, the apostles, or Stephen himself picking up arms yeah. in order to, um, to fight their enemies. Um, that's the difference between the, the martyrdom that we see in Christianity and, and perhaps other faiths. Uh, we lay down our lives so others may gain life. Yes. Um, and that is, that is how Christians ought to live with the love for their enemies. And here we see that, again, um, there's obviously this great opposition, threat, some real threat that they follow through with. But um, for yourself, Anthony, how do you fight fear? And how do you step out courageously to do God's will? Yeah, absolutely. Each and every day, like, we'll run into a situation where we might feel fear, any, any time in our lives we'll feel fear. But for me, every time I always go back to 
Reading an encouraging verse, each one of us will have a different verse, but something that really speaks to us. For me, my personal favorite, whether I'm feeling or hearing the enemy tell me that you're not qualified, you shouldn't be doing this, I always remind it, it is written, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Another personal favorite is uh, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. So fear does not belong in perfect love, which is God. Mm -hmm. And I always remind myself of those verses when I'm feeling, you know, and facing fear. Another thing as well is the Holy Spirit is the one that empowers. He's the one who changes hearts and minds. So I am simply acting as a conduit for God's love. My job is simply to love the other person mm -hmm. and just to proclaim the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit does the rest. Yeah, That's good. Absolutely. And that takes away so much pressure of us thinking that I, I'm the one who has to save Amen. or convert the person. We, we preach with the goal of conversion that someone will turn to Christ, repent and believe. But the, the timing that it takes, or if it ever happens, it's, again, it's, it's up to God. And that takes away so much pressure. And uh, you've, you've, uh, we also see in Stephen's story that how he so willingly uh, serves. Yes. Uh, he's full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. He's, uh, he's intelligent, he's smart. Um, but he's like, serve tables, like yes. cleaning tables, yeah. p picking up dishes, I will do that. Yes. And he's ready to serve. How has serving changed your life? Yeah, absolutely. Serving has completely changed my life. At first, we were thinking, oh, serving is just, I'm just volunteering. But it's much more than that. It's us actively living out the, the word of God and mm -hmm. us putting on God's love. And as the Bible says, if you do not have love, then you do not know God, because mm -hmm. God is love. And as we're serving, we're not just providing a service, but we're actively learning how to love God's, God's people. And rather than just looking at it, oh, I'm gaining new skills, or I'm part of a team, you also see people's lives change and transform. And that's just simply amazing, and it's priceless. Another thing that is very interesting, the Holy Spirit will highlight different things as you're serving that. To others, it might seem insignificant, but to you, it really changes you. And it's, it's almost like you're ministering to yourself more than others in, mm. in a weird sort of way. And it really helps shape your character and your faith. I agree. Yeah. Serving others, it, it makes us step out of our comfort zone, as Pastor Dave said. Yeah. There will be people that you serve that you have to lean on God in order to have that love, compassion. And it keeps reminding you of how, how God loves you in, in your brokenness, in your lack, in your need. And so we reach out with the same grace. Now, we, we talk about how Stephen, in, in his life, he... He was able to accomplish what he did because of his faith in God. And we know that faith comes by hearing and the word of Christ. And so he had the word of God in his heart already. Yes. So when this persecution happened, he didn't just let me pull out my scroll out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Remember back then that scrolls they didn't yeah. have like a Bible like this where you just pick it up and open it up. And he didn't have time for that. So um, I can see you're very organized. Oh, Try your be. Bible Try is... <laughs> Man, you can find the word like very quick here. Um, so how have you, what have you found out being helpful for you to get this in your heart? Because we can have 18 Bibles at home yes. and do us no good, um, right? And so how do you get this uh, practice in your heart? Uh, well, the first thing I would say is everyone find a translation that you could actually easily read. Mm -hmm. If you are not good with the King James Version, then don't buy that. Mm -hmm. um, and stick with a good Bible reading plan that actually interests you. Um, and if you feel like, oh, that's just too much for me to convict to, then find some verses that really speak to your heart and just study those. Mm -hmm. Study the Hebrew versions of it, the, what it says in the Greek, and you'll be surprised that some words can have 10 different meanings and it just opens up the scripture to you. And just by doing that, you'll start to gain more interest and more, just more passion for God because you'll find God in here. Mm -hmm. And you will, you will keep seeking him. And that That's really good. has helped me for sure. Yeah. And so memorization, again, different people can memorize in different ways. You can look that up. Mm -hmm. There are techniques to do so. But I think just going through it every day yeah. is something that's key. Listening to it, I often find it helpful to read and listen to the Bible. And you can do that on the YouVersion Bible app. Yeah. And uh, if when you do pick a verse, just say, hey, this verse for this month, I will memorize it by the end of the month. Yes. And then every month, just take a new verse or a new passage that you go through. It's good to remember when you do that, also you want to make sure that you read within the context. So yeah, don't absolutely. cherry pick and then misunderstand the verse and then memorize it. 
and uh, make a whole doctrine out of it. Uh, please, 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 I beg you, <laughs> if you do take a verse, just read the whole book or read the whole chapter and then make sure that you understand what that verse means uh, as written by the author. Uh, so we want to do that. And, and then when the time comes when you push, you're squeezed, good things come out of you because you've already, for instance, read now you you understood how Stephen, how he responded to his persecutors. And then you see the parallel between him and Jesus' persecutors. Yes. And then when your persecution happens with you, instead of outbursts, instead of returning evil with evil, what will you do? You're like, you're reminded of this. Amen. Yeah. And you go, okay, this is, I've heard, I've read in the word and I know this is how I'm to respond by grace. You remember Pastor Dave's teaching. And then you, by the power of the Spirit, you respond in a way that honors Christ. Amen. So thank you, Anthony. Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll Good see you one, next everyone. weekend.